Good morning! Thank you so much for joining me um, on today's Wellness Wednesdays. Today I'll be speaking with Pavi Jagadia. Um, I'm gonna give my little intro spiel. So it is my deepest belief that self-care in the form of equipping oneself with the right personal and professional development tools is anything but indulgent. Self-care involves prioritizing one's well-being. It is a comprehensive concept which, if practiced correctly, enhances our relationship with ourselves, others, and our immediate environment. With this new series, Wellness Wednesdays for Minorities in STEM, I hope to challenge the norm with the audacious notion that to succeed, you have to take up more care of yourself, intellectually, socially, spiritually, and physically first before anything else, particularly amongst us minorities. And with that, I'd like to introduce my second guest. So Pavi Jagadia is an international student from Mumbai, India, currently pursuing her master's in aerospace engineering at Georgia Tech. She graduated magna cum laude from Cornell University with five internships under her belt, which is really exciting, and is weathering out the pandemic alongside her boyfriend and their new puppy Comet. Um, <clears throat> so today we'll be chatting about hope, networking, and building support systems as an international student, and I'll be adding her on right now. For her to join. <clears throat> Hi, good morning. <laughs> morning. Um, Bobby, are you ready to jump into the chat? Yeah, yeah, let's do this. Okay, perfect. So we'll start with a little introduction about yourself, um, of anything that you feel like I haven't maybe covered. And um, yeah, it could be like colorful. And really, if you had to describe yourself in a catchy sentence, what would it be? Sure, yeah. So I've been a lifelong space nerd. I went from a little girl wanting to be a little Indian girl wanting to be an astronaut to now being, you know, been in the States for six years doing aerospace engineering and focusing on orbit. Outside of that, um, recently, my hobbies are I, I, I have started painting again after forever, thanks to 2020. Uh, raising my puppy and more engineering focused, I really want to help women in aerospace and international students in the U.S. just navigate their college experience, their career experiences. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so I think you touched a little bit already on your STEM interests, and I did so in the intro as well. Um, but I kind of wanted to ask you why specifically you chose the STEM path that you did, and um, Initially, what were your thoughts on the difference that you wanted to make with that STEM interest? Sure, yeah. So, uh, like I mentioned, I was, I always knew I was going to do aerospace. I just, I saw the man on the moon um, in the newspaper when I was like five or something. And I was like, wow, okay, this is, this is like a cool job to have. I want to do it. Um, so, I, I had that in mind. So, I pursued STEM like throughout high school. And then I decided to move to the States because everyone kept saying, if you want to do aerospace, you know, you should, you should be where NASA is. Um, so I applied to the States and then I came here. I did um, aerospace and my, uh, I did mechanical focusing on aerospace in my undergrad, did a lot of, all of my research was with JPL. So there was a lot of satellite work going on over there. Um, and the, the idea of difference, making a difference through STEM for me was always answering the big questions answering you know our place in the universe and how how did these systems form and and then the helping life on earth kind of falls as a subsidiary because every new technology you know helps uh human technology on earth uh, which is something i realized way more when i did my planet internship because like planet's a company i love because of how much they focus on their social impact and i it gives me the sense of I am actually doing something for the world, even though I am pursuing something uh, that I've dreamed of. Uh, yeah, yeah, did that help answer that? <laughs> yeah, it did. Um, and I kind of want to go back a little bit to how your specific research at school helped you to manifest this interest, or even the schools, um, just the um, path of going to Cornell first and then Georgia Tech. Um, how did that 
help to really manifest the interest of um, wanting to make that difference, that specific difference. Yeah, of course. So going to going to Cornell first, I it was definitely a more liberal arts school with an engineering program. So the approach to education was very holistic, um, which at, at tech now is very rigorous. It's very get your grades, get out of here, get your job. Um, but at Cornell, a lot of like activities and uh, clubs were promoted. So you were you were always doing STEM, but you were involved with I was involved with a lot of um, social organizations and some cultural organizations. And then uh, based on the different hobbies I had. So I feel like unknowingly I had a very um, wholesome life, <laughs> which is why like I was able to survive uh, <laughs> engineering. Um, yeah, so, and then that is something that I tried to continue when I came to Georgia Tech, where I tried to be a part of these, uh, be a part of groups that weren't just engineering based because, because doing when you, I, I did a lot of classes and a lot of heavy research and doing those things together, you can get very narrow minded and your idea of success and your idea of thriving is based entirely on your progress in the career. And you kind of, you want to shift that interest. Um, so yeah, that, that's how, that's one difference and benefit that I had going from Cornell to Georgia Tech. And professionally, the research that I did kind of helped me understand that I don't want to be, I would like to, but like being an astronaut is in my uh, end all. Uh, I found, I found my niche within orbit. So I, I, I kind of continued, um, pursuing that in grad school. And that's my research now trying to do some orbits work for outer planets. Okay, that is all amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I kind of wanted to pivot to the things that um, are really the topic at hand that I wanted to unpack with you. Um, the first one really being hope. Um, so given that international students in the United States um, find it really challenging to recruit or to get specific experiences that can really help to supplement their learning in the classroom, um, it's really easy to kind of um, be on more of the desperate side of the recruiting cycle rather than being on the hopeful side to um, where you get to your, the point where you're thriving. Um, and so really my question um, is, how have you been cultivating hope every day as you continue to recruit amidst the pandemic for a full-time position? Yeah. Um, yeah, like you said, like being an international student, you from the very beginning don't have the same opportunities that you would have otherwise. So it becomes a chain. Like if you didn't have a NASA internship in your undergrad, no one's going to give you a NASA internship in your grad school. And then you're not going to expect, you know, a job <laughs> when you graduate. Um, so it's, uh, for one, the most obvious one that I've tried to implement now is when I go into interviews or I go to, um, uh, recruitment events, just being your own advocate and mentioning that being an international student, you did not have access to these opportunities earlier in your education. But now you can because, you know, you're talking to a company that does, um, if it's a startup, it will take international students. Um, but just making that, filling that gap for them because they don't know why you weren't able to pursue certain opportunities. And it wasn't because you weren't smart enough or talented enough. It was you you just legally were not able to. Um, Outside of that, it does get it does get really frustrating. Um, so one thing I've started doing is looking up people who have um, similar who have like my dream job uh, on LinkedIn or just online, and then finding them, cold emailing them, and ninety nine percent of the time they will they will chat with you. So you talk like I do informational interviews. So I just ask them, you know, what their goals were, how they ended up getting in this position. Uh, what like um, what skills will be important five years from now? So then I can take you know I can take that answer, sit down and cultivate those skills because that way I'm doing something productive with my time instead of just getting frustrated. Um, and sometimes and most often it'll come out that they didn't expect to get where they did, and then you see you see how their story turned out, and that gives you hope that you know if they can do it, I can do it. Um, and one more thing is. I personally didn't do it until 2020 happened, but uh, keeping um, just keeping a journal and a history of you of sorts, like what did you expect from life when you were 15? And like most, you will have surpassed it. 
you know. Uh, so just in having that with you kind of keeps you grounded in in that you know you have you you've been surpassing expectations from the very beginning. So you even in this position, like you can you can you can do it. So, in summary, I want to pick out like a couple of the things you said. Um, I think the first thing that. Uh, you said that stuck with me is to really like take control of your story um, when you're talking to people who like (laughs) might hold the keys to your next job Um, but yeah like actively and intentionally creating and shaping that story so that they see really what you want them to see such that um, you know that you've like given it your all when you're standing in front of them (laughs) and you're not necessarily like fiddling with your resume Um, when we like go back in person um, to career fairs and um, the next thing you said that kind of stuck with me was just like a journal so that before you even get to the point of like owning your story you can remind yourself really of who you are because of how often we like forget (laughs) Um, because we live in our heads um, sometimes with like not as nice thoughts as someone else would the syndrome Um, gets you (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I really love that. And um, I think you mentioned um, something about informational interviews, which helps me transition really into my next question pertaining to Hope, which is, um, how do you differentiate between the hope versus <laughs> desperation when you keep reaching out? Um, so I know you mentioned reaching out, but um, oftentimes as international students, we like can get turned down um i know you mentioned like 90 percent of the time they do respond but for that other 10 percent um there are sometimes um moments where like others watching this like might not be at that like 90 10 ratio (laughs) they might be at kind of like a 60 40 where like 40 percent of the time like people don't respond at all Mm -hmm. um and sometimes it like feels discouraging because the evidence that is like staring back at you tells you (laughs) that like this isn't working so um for that like 10 percent uh do you have any like advice um or what do you usually do to brush it off and keep going sure yeah um also so when i do say 90 percent respond it's like over the course of three four months like they, they'll read my message and then a month later they will be like i was so busy i'll meet you you know we can talk like after this big deadline is done like two months from now and i'm like okay i will see you then um but it's so it's, it's a lot of patience involved um and in in those cold messages, I never really approach them with a perspective of um, I'm reaching out to you because I'm trying to recruit right now. It's it's just a hundred percent. I you know I love what you do and I would like to talk to you and learn more. And then if it becomes a recruitment conversation after you've spoken to them, like, awesome. Uh, most often, you know, you just chat with them, you learn from them, and it ends there because they're engineers without recruiting powers. Um, yeah, um, but yeah, so when you do get turned down, it's more of a recognizing that, my, like, I, I look at my inbox and it's like thousands of unread emails and just recognizing that they probably have like tens of thousands and, um, you know, this is not something that might be their priority right now. They were not obligated to speak with me anyway. So um, also recognizing, like, if they if they didn't want to speak with you, you wouldn't probably have gotten a lot of, you know, a lot out of that conversation. Um, and then moving on to the next person, you know, moving on to like someone in their team or someone who's, you know, a position above them or below them, just, um, just getting, yeah, branching out on that network. But, uh, but yeah, but just recognizing that it's not always you, it's people just have very busy lives and people do not share the same interests as you. So they may not, um, just not taking it personally. Yeah. So what I really got out of what you said was, um, I think we need to like really start early so that we are having conversations not necessarily when we need to like when um for example like a visa is at stake or like yeah like not when the clock is ticking but um kind of making it a priority to um like have conver- like have a conversation every day or like have um like three conversations a week or some some sort of schedule like that so that it becomes like more natural and you only get better with practice um exactly. and looking back like if you have all these conversations in a week like um 
you have so many people to like reach back to and like ask questions that um sometimes you can like problem solve just by like um throwing ideas off and like bouncing ideas around yeah I love that okay so um I kind of want to pivot now to just resources for mental health um and I want to talk about like tools that you've used so um either like therapy apps websites um keeping up with friendships from back home um like with the time difference and just oftentimes when we're international students like even those friends back home are like not maybe back home maybe they're like in another country in a totally other like time zone so um yeah can you kind of speak to some of those tools that you've used yeah of course so um a big and easy transition for me was uh cleaning up my social media so i start <laughs> i i realized i was spending a lot of time on instagram so i should just um you know follow content that is good for me or like helps with you know so i i started following a lot of self care content unfollowed a bunch of like bands that i don't need to keep up with <laughs> and so that way like my wall now is you know inspirational and positive content when i check it like every morning um and keeping a journal we we already spoke about it but i just started journaling which helps um just helps keep you grounded and, you know helps um just be, like you said remind yourself um that you are you know much bigger <laughs> than how you feel right now um and uh i would recommend therapy i've i've done it before uh, it's it can like you you can always get something positive out of it and as students i feel like we get good insurance so we should just exploit it <laughs> <when> we, <laughs> um and about about being an international student it it gets very um it it gets difficult trying to keep up with friends from back home so you kind of like there are three people that i make sure i text every single day just to just to check up on them and then they'll check up on me and we just kind of know you know what's up in each other's lives and they may not respond like the second you need them to but but you know that there are people you know all the way across the world who like care about your well-being so you should too um and like scheduling calls with people so like my undergrad friend group we make sure we call like once a month and doing the same with like international student friends and sometimes like this this is easy to say right now but like you know at the peak of the semester when all the, you know all the midterms are hitting you and there are homeworks that's when you need it the most but that's when you are least likely to follow through so that's why like if you have a planner just before you start the month just put down like weekends where you will you know call a friend and put down everyone's birthday so at least like for their birthday you will end up and you know have a long conversation with them um a thing i used to do in my undergrad is send postcards to um my international student friends because it's just so so personal uh you sit down you write it and you you don't expect it to get there for like 2 3 weeks so mm-hmm. it's just it your gratitude like spans the whole month <laughs> and um uh, so i would i would highly recommend that um okay so i kind of wanted to talk a little bit about one of the things you shared in terms of therapy um mm-hmm. given that this like series is for minorities in stem um oftentimes um even though therapy is being encouraged more um for example on social media platforms such as instagram where um like we often get ads like from better help or talk space um right. which is yeah. which is great to promote it um oftentimes it's like not necessarily a resource that we reach out to because maybe um culturally um we've been like conditioned like more so to think that um that isn't like a form of help that we should um require almost and it's like sometimes hard to um use it or talk about it with um any like parental figures in our life or even with our friends um so i was wondering if you could kind of like in a couple sentences just like share what your experience has been in like navigating um conversations um surrounding therapy in the sense that like um like how have you shared it or like if it's like come up um has there been um like any discomfort and if so how have you navigated that yeah um there is discomfort it is um it, yeah everything you said is true where you know there is the stigma around therapy that like you don't only 
you don't need it until you're like at your absolute worst. Um, and so initially talking to like family about therapy was, um, was not something I knew how to do. So I just didn't do it for a while. I, I kind of just, you know, I went to therapy when I needed to and they, they just didn't know. Um, and then eventually when I, it was like doing therapy made me feel more empowered to talk about it. So then that's when I like spoke to, spoke to my mom and spoke to, you know, just explained to her that like, it's not, it's not the way um, it's, it's portrayed almost because it's not just that there is a stigma around it. It's just no one does it. So they re really don't know what it even means to like go to therapy. Um, and then once you, once you explain to her that it's just, you know, talking to someone who is more qualified, uh, and she's like, oh, okay, cool. Um, fine. And I'm like, okay, then I, you know, it just, it became a much easier conversation, just giving them, just recognizing that they're not, um, acting, they're not holding up the stigma because they want to, it's because they haven't known better. So you just give them you give them that better and then they have um when they have the full perspective most often they will understand you because you know they want you to be healthy and happy um yeah, yeah. So and i had a question oh sorry um oh, I, was so I, gonna say, <laughs> I was gonna say with friends here it's easy because like in you know in in the states like therapy is like just another thing so it hasn't really been stigmatic here to talk to like friends or research partners or you know you just it's just a conversation like yeah um okay sorry for cutting you off um i had a question about um kind of again because we're talking um to and for minorities in stem there's like uh such a wide spectrum of people um and i personally didn't know that like when you sign up on a platform um for example like united health which is the uh like insurance provider for georgia tech students um i didn't know that you could um kind of specify um the therapist whose help you'd want um when it comes to maybe their um like ethnic background um and so like for me like being like ethnically indian and then growing up in singapore um that's like a little venn diagram there um but i didn't realize that i could actually like look for um people who kind of like fit the same venn diagram so they would kind of like understand my perspective really well or just understand my story <laughs> well um and so i'm curious how like one goes about that on like a platform like uh, <laughs> when you're like looking at it and when there's like problem sets and exams that are maybe like more important um, <laughs> and so you want to like be really efficient with the time that you're spending on like looking for your perfect therapist um how does one kind of like have that match um, maybe your ethnic background, if that's something that you care about. Yeah. Um, so one thing that was like the most basic thing that I did was just go and say Georgia Indian therapist. And then I, there came up a list. But then, like like you said, like insurance is its own thing. And like most often they will not, um, you know, either take insurance or fit into the exact insurance that you have. So what I ended up doing after I did that, I realized that like these therapists um, advertise themselves um, like they have these qualifications, but they also serve like via different languages. And so this like even though you would want therapy in English, um, if you are looking for an Indian therapist, they might speak Hindi also. Uh, and so they'll have that on their profile. So you can just go into that therapist portal that you um, mentioned and then there is like a sort by languages and you just pick every all the languages but English, you know, the ones that are relevant to the ethnic background that um, is specific to you. And then most often you will find a therapist um, that is like either, you know, off the origins of the country that like that, like you're looking for. Um, and that was like a big when I found out that I could do that. Um, but yeah, it, it does help more than just because when because Another thing that's a problem is they list themselves multiple times. So you have like thousands of people to go through and not a good way to navigate that. So languages. Um, spoken. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So I think I have like two or three more questions left. So um, the last one on these topics surrounding um, support systems and in-person support systems. Um, so 
really during the pandemic, um, it, it was hard to um, always like keep in touch with friends like in person and um, it was restricted even. But I feel as though with um, just your boyfriend and your little puppy, um, you've managed to really like cultivate a healthy support system, um, but really intentionally. Um, and so I kind of, <laughs> sorry, wanted to um, ask you about tips for coexisting with your boyfriend and dog during a pandemic and uh, really creating this effective and healthy support system that like serves you as an engineer and like helps you become a better engineer and just a better like all around person. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could kind of speak to that. Yeah. Um... For one, I would not recommend getting a puppy when you're still in grad school. Um, they're just, all the work that you think, you know, it will take, it will take like 10 times more. Um, but because it was, you know, because of the pandemic, we were always home. So we were, both my boyfriend and I were able to, were able to put in all the work required. And now he's, he's like, love you, dog. Uh, and apart, so, so yeah, uh, my boyfriend, he is also an aerospace engineering grad student. Um, so we both kind of have the same or very similar time commitment. Um, so the one thing we started doing was separate workplaces. Uh, so, you know, I take the dining room, he takes like the study in the bedroom um, and just setting aside like few hours where we're just going to get work done. So like when it hits 5 p.m., we can we can like stop working and which is like easy to say, but but like as long as you have you are trying to meet a deadline, if it's not 5 p.m., at least at 7 p.m., you're going to stop, you know, stop working and then you can go do other things. Um, and then thanks to Comet, my my puppy, my dog, <laughs> it, it, there is a very set routine that I have to follow for him. So I got to walk him in the morning, walk him in the evening, go out, you know, a few times a day. And that gives you, that like allowed me to have this uh, connection with the outside world, which like otherwise I had no reason <laughs> to. Um, and yeah, so. I'm just, I'm, yeah, sorry. I'm trying to think of all the things that we did. So it's good because we, so I kept my schedule and my deadlines and I kept a list of like my boyfriend's schedules and his, his deadlines. And that way I could, you know, I could keep him accountable. He, he did the same for me. So if I have an exam coming up, if I have homework coming up, he will take more of the, um, you know, puppy work and housework and I'll go do my things. And then we'll switch over when he has work to do. So just uh, being very communicative about your time requirements and what you want to achieve, not just like professionally, but also personally in like for that week or for that month, like I wanted to paint more. So I would, I, I told, I would, I literally just have to communicate that. And then, you know, even every evening he'd be like, did you paint today? That's some, you know, that's someone else reminding you that, oh, this is a thing you needed to do. And now, you know, you can, um, you, you can do it. Um, but yeah, just being, being very explicit about what you want from, you know, from your experience together and um, yeah, and being that person for them so they can be that for you. And when it comes to communicating um, just the extra struggles um, of like recruiting as an international student or even just like living so far away from home as an international student during a pandemic, do you have any, um, kind of tips for communicating that effectively that like doesn't sound like <laughs> um that you're spiraling or like <laughs> having a mental breakdown um what are like does journaling help or are are there ways to kind of like maybe write it down like hey like this is like what I'm feeling and this is how like all of this stuff is like adding up and contributing to me maybe like not being at my best the other night or like do you have any tips like that yeah yeah journaling definitely helps uh keeping in touch with friends from home um, because they're, it's like being an international student, neither your friends here nor your friends back home 100% understand your experience. So you kind of pick and choose. It's really like talk. you and your self. Yeah. <laughs> Me, yes. myself, and I, like, I'm trying to <laughs> dig myself out of this hole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you, you know, you talk to your international student friends about like being homesick and, you know, wishing that you could do the pandemic like with family at home and then talking to your friends here who are going through the recruitment struggles about about the recruitment struggles just making sure that like all the things that are on your mind you are communicating it with someone so it, it becomes problematic when you like expect one person to understand all of your problems because most often they won't um so yeah so just making sure that you keep in touch with like people who understand the different spheres of your life 
Right. And then even maybe like sharing what you learned, like, hey, like I spoke to a friend Z in like India and um, this was the thing that I like brought to them and I just like wanted you to know that this is like what I felt and this is the um, solution or just the conclusion that I came to from this conversation and like this is kind of where I'm at. So that it's like you're bringing both the problem and the conclusion to your partner um, and like not living, leaving them in the dark in terms of like, yeah. what you're experiencing <laughs> but it's like not their um bag of stuff to sort out yeah yeah it's, uh, yeah, it's also like yeah recognizing that they've never had to experience any of this so you know mm-hmm. when you're frustrated about say your visa like they probably don't even know how how to you know get that visa or like what it means to have it so just you know taking like an hour out and like talking about what different legalities mean for you and why you're so uh, why you need to have a job and why you need to um, why you need why you you're so desperate to do like xyz things like before the end of the year um and like you know they it's like they just want to understand you they just have never had the reason to know the things you know uh so just giving it like stating it to them right okay so um these are like my last two questions um the first one being tell me about your morning or night routine um and I believe this like involves uh your dog comment um (laughs) and what really helps you like bounce back when you fall off track um because of uh just something really demanding in school or recruiting or life um yeah what helps you like get back on track yeah uh so my I think my morning routine is the most uh, diligent one because <laughs> at night it's just whatever happens. I, you usually find me passed out on the sofa or something. <laughs> um, so in the morning, uh, my puppy wakes me up because he is he wakes up when the sun rises. So uh, I wake up with him. Uh, we go for a long walk, which is very, very therapeutic. I listen to most often a, you know, some kind of uh, meditative podcast. Um, and then we come home. Uh, I give him breakfast, he takes a nap, that gives me time to do like, uh, you know, make breakfast, I try to do some yoga in there, try to squeeze in some journaling. Um, And then that's like a three hour, three hour block, you know, morning that I like, spent completely like with myself. So I, um, yeah, and I make sure like I do, I I, kind of have to because I have to walk my dog. So I'm so the rest of it kind of happens because of that. Uh, which I would, you know, puppy or no puppy, I would highly recommend like taking the first few hours of your day for yourself. Um, and like, it doesn't have to be like meditative and yoga. It just, it could be like, if you want to work out or if you want to listen to like true crime, just like taking some time with you though. Um, and things, what I do when I not feeling the best is, I mean, this is just for me. I used, I grew up watching like, um, cosmos and carl sagan videos and stuff on youtube so like when i'm absolutely feeling um you know when when like the jobs aren't hitting you up i would i I just go back and watch those videos again and kind of just ground myself on why i'm trying so hard to do this thing that i'm wanting to do um so whatever that be for you like whatever inspired you to begin uh you know pursuing um what you want to pursue in the first place just go back and touch touch base again um, if you've journaled in the past, then go back and read previous journal entries and see how far you've come. Uh, yeah. That sounds amazing. Um, I think I can probably like summarize some of the resources that you send me and um, hyperlink it as like a blog post yeah. um, just to this. Um, so I can kind of have like your Carl Sagan videos and um, the yoga that you use in the morning or the stuff that you listen to as you like take a walk in the morning. Um, I think that'll be really good because if you like rattle off like a link or something, it wouldn't make sense. Yeah, right now, but I think I can hyperlink it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, last question. What does wellness mean to you as an engineer? Okay. So this is a very ongoing discovery for me. It, it was more only through grad school that I realized that I, I want to put, like I want to be more intentional about, Uh, how I take care of myself and, you know, my social circle and just, um, and so right now it just means keeping, for a while it was keeping my head above the water, but right now it's very just recognizing or finding that voice, finding, you know, the story I was talking about and, and being confident in that and recognizing that like, 
you aren't defined by like the job you have or the degree you have like it's more it's more how the whole story and how you came you know how you became you um and outside of that outside of like that was a very uh thematic answer so outside of that in in daily life it just means you know keeping up to a routine keeping up with friends just having just having life outside of my engineering work and and i've seen like the more i do that the more i thrive at said engineering work uh so i want to yeah i want to keep doing that and so that looks like the walks in the morning the yeah. podcast the yoga um the yeah. painting um yeah having, yeah like, healthy yeah. conversations with your partner exactly meeting friends once in a while going to the park you know just yeah things that aren't work <laughs> therapy <laughs> all the important things yeah oh my goodness thank you so much for chatting with me those are really all my questions um and before we end I just wanted to thank you so much for being um really honest and uh for bringing up stuff that often isn't like brought up in like engineering labs um and hopefully with this series like minorities in STEM can kind of show up more authentically in the spaces that they occupy. Um, so thank you so much for your time and your story. And I really appreciate you. Of course. Thank you so much for doing this. I, I love, love this initiative. I, you know, okay. I wish I had it when I started on. Um, yeah, thank you. Amazing. Okay, so I'm going to log off now and end the live. But to anyone tuned in right now, um, this will go on my IGTV. Um, so you can just scroll on that, watch it whenever, um, watch it on like, or listen to it like when you go on a walk somewhere. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining. Um, and bye. <laughs>